This is Pat Parfrey. Welcome to the Canadian Rock. All right, and welcome back to the Canadian Rock. This is Jamie Gray. This pod, we're fortunate enough to have Rugby Canada's and the pride of Newfoundland, Pat Parfrey on with us. Pat's played over 30 matches with Canada, had a breakout performance for Canada at the Rugby World Cup last uh, September back in uh, over in Japan. Uh, he, had a, he had a dandy performance, uh, all, all matches there for Canada. Currently kind of toiling with the uh, MLR's Toronto Arrows, but at the same time, he's actually uh, doing his PhD in clinical epidemiology me i know i butchered that word i apologize pat he's over he's back in newfoundland at memorial university taking uh taking that up there it's a pretty intensive course load and uh also he was just uh awarded with the 2019 rugby canada canadian shield award which is a pretty impressive uh pretty impressive award and we'll get into that for sure before we get to pat we got a you know we got our contact info we got our news coming up and things like that but uh, we love having you contact us, whether it's on Twitter. I love going and bantering back and forth with the folks on Twitter. We're at, at Canadian Ruck. And uh, on Instagram, we're at the underscore Canadian underscore Ruck and getting some followers and subscribers there. And Facebook as well. Um, Facebook, I think, is like, if it was the if it was a country, it would be the third largest country in the world. So we're slowly building our Facebook page. And our Facebook is at the Canadian Ruck. So we're trying to, you know, we're definitely not trying to compete with china or anything with uh amount of people on there but the more we get on there the better and if you want to reach out to me we're at gmail the canadian rock at gmail.com drop me a line send me a voice question things like that and we'll get it we'll, we'll throw it up on the pod for you uh what i enjoy is, is you know seeing some of the stats is uh, you know the watchers and then listeners and things things like that and the followers and subscribers which is amazing so thank you all who who take part in doing that but make sure that you're sharing it as well because these are great rugby stories that we're sharing of some canadian legends and how they get to where they are and what they're doing after rugby and what they're doing you know during COVID as they you know continue to prepare for the following season or the olympics or what have you and uh it, it's nice when we can share those messages around and share those stories around so when you watch and listen make sure you follow subscribe but also make sure that you share send it out to your you know your mates send it out to your your work co-workers send it out to people on your rugby team or your hockey team or your ball team or what have you your cooking club like i don't care send it to, send it to anybody um but you know let's just let them know we're on youtube if they want to kick back and relax for an hour and throw throw it up in their tablet and lay in bed and watch a watch a nice story or if they just want to listen to it while they're in the car or mowing the lawn or whatever you know we're on the spotify itunes google Podcasts, and Castbox. and of course anytime you forget where we are just head to our website the canadian ruck dot weebly dot com and all content is uh is centered in there as well this week we got a couple of big shout outs. One is a friend of the pod, Tyler Arjun. Tyler's been on a couple of times, as you all know, and we're trying to get him on a third time with a round table. Uh, and as you probably know, he's over in France playing for Castra. And uh, my French accent's not very strong, so I hope I didn't mess that up. Uh, he had a big role in their win last weekend. Keep it up, you know, Captain Canada. And as I record this pod, they're, uh, they're a few hours away from kickoff. So it, uh, he, uh, he's getting ready. He's getting geared up for his next match. And the other big shout out, Friday was 9-11, so Friday past was uh, 19th anniversary of the terrorist attacks of 9-11, and uh, I want to give a little shout out to Mark Bingham. Mark Bingham was a young man who decided in high school he wanted to play, uh, play rugby, just something different to do, um, really fell in love with the game, and then shortly after that he came out as gay, and uh, he was actually on Flight 93 during 9-11. So flight 93, if you remember, if you don't remember, is the one where some passengers took the flight over and crashed uh, the plane into a field in Pennsylvania. So it didn't actually reach its intended target. Mark was actually one of those four who fought back on the plane and, and caused it to crash in the, in the middle of that field. Uh, and right now there's a rugby tournament that's held biannually in his, in his honor. And this year it was supposed to be in Ottawa, uh, but because of COVID due to COVID, it wasn't being held, but it's, uh, it's from what I can gather, it's the largest men's tournament uh, held, uh, held in the world. And uh, as I said, it's biannually. So thank you, Mark. Thank you for what you did uh, on flight 93 to save as many people as you could, along with uh, those three other people that helped you. And uh, it's something that won't be forgotten. 
Uh, saying that, we're going to dig into some rugby news. And the first up, uh, and it's it's a little bit, it's a few days old as I record this, and I wasn't going to touch it, but um, the more I thought about it, the more I realized, no, this, um, we really need to talk about this because this was just a, I don't know if travesty is the word or what well, travesty to the game for sure, but Owen Farrell, um, he's just a predator. Uh, he, he's almost a meathead. Uh, you know, he had a 20 yard run, you know, fine. I get it. He's, he's going, he's attacking hard on defense, but a little much. And uh, the kicker for me was the fact that it was basically a, an old school, think of like the ultimate warrior <laughs> Hulk Hogan back in the eighties and nineties, WWF, you know, doing a flying clothesline that damn near decapitated Charlie Atkinson and Charlie Atkinson, I think he's only like 19. I mean, that doesn't matter. He's, he's out on the pitch. He's, he's one of the, he's one of the players. Um, but what a, what a horrible start to that young man's career because Farrell decided that, you know, instead of making a good, hard, clean tackle, I'm, I'm just going to try and take your head off. Um, that's that's been Farrell's mo for the last few years. I think in 2016 there was a similar incident to this. And if you look back to most events um, in the World Cup, for sure there was I don't know how many times he should have get carded for a shoulder charge, uh, shoulder contact to the head, and things like that. And the and the and it's just kind of swept aside. And uh, to me, he's one of the dirtiest tacklers in the game. That was my gray area. Last pod was. Um, not, pod, not I guess not on the pod. Sorry, but I just threw that question out there. But I think it's a worst tackler, and that could be a that could be a misworded. I think he's the dirtiest tackler in rugby and world rugby. And you know, you don't see a play like that in high school. You don't see a play like that at club rugby. You should definitely not see it in a professional setting. Even beyond that was the horrible decision by the RFU. You know, starting with a ten game ban, leave it there. Ten game, great. But they reduced it to five, like WTF. What did they reduce it to five for? And they reduced because they basically said, well, he's a good bloke off the field and he does volunteer work. What in the hell's up with that? There's a lot of good people who do volunteer work, but that, that's that got nothing to do with what he did on the pitch. How does that make him less responsible for his on-field actions? It doesn't, in my opinion. Or how about Eddie Jones jumping in to save him, right? Coach of, coach of England. His suspension is going to be up now just in time for the England's uh, Autumn International. So good on you, Eddie, for, you know, yeah, sticking up for your uh, sticking up for your star player. But geez, man, like how's the guy ever going to learn if he's always got people bending over backwards to bail him out of stuff? Now, Farrell did apologize after Atkinson woke up. But Atkinson, he didn't look too keen to see him or hear from him. And you can't blame him. The poor kid, you know, got lights out by one of his idols. Like he's just fresh out of high school plays 10 and more than likely Farrell is one of those guys that he looked up to as a hero as they say never meet your heroes and this play is definitely a good reason why Atkinson we wish you a speedy recovery but hopefully uh, hopefully you're back on the pitch and you know get some redemption by putting up some tries or giving a good hard tackle on on Farrell on top of that the RFU for years has been talking about player safety and I don't know how a five game ban. I don't know how a five game ban fits into that. Farrell, on top of that, has also been joining in on the player safety talks. I guess he doesn't drink his own Kool Aid, but I digress. All right, let's move on to some more um, upbeat news, I guess. So, uh, Australia has been uh, awarded the rugby championships. So, San Sansar has deemed Australia to have a better quarantine protocols. Uh, so that they will be hosting the rugby championship. South Africa and Argentina, this means they'll actually get to train as soon as they pretty much land in Australia. And that was a key selling point um, for Sanzar for Australian rugby. But saying that, New Zealand's still going to get to host two Bledisloe Cup matches, October 17th and October 24th. So, you know, five, six weeks out. And following those two matches, New Zealand and Australia will both head over to Australia for the remainder of the rugby championship. Also in international news, Autumn's, the Autumn Nations Cup shaping up. Um, are you looking for that six, uh, eight, I guess, eight nations fix this fall that's kicking off in November? So you got pools of pool ones, France, Scotland, Italy, and Fiji. And then you also have England, Ireland, Wales, and Georgia. Uh, and it's, it's going to be easier to stream now. It's going to be on Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime is actually airing 14 matches. You know, uh, before it starts, sign up for a free account. You get a, you get a month free. Uh, and then maybe I think it's like 10 or 10 or $12, like Netflix, you just pay a little bit. So there's a great way to see some great autumn nationals. 
internationals. On the local front, we get a couple of things, and I love this one coming out of Texas. Um, defensive coordinator Chris Ash of the University of Texas Longhorn football team is actually teaching his team how to rugby tackle. As Ash said, it's just shoulder tackling. We want to be able to be, we want to be able to be on the forefront of trying to tackle in a way that we could reduce the number of blows to the head. I just think it's the safest way to tackle. Honestly, it's the most effective way. Thank you, Chris Ash, for, for, for uh, doing this for your football, because who doesn't love watching football, but some of the tackling is so shoddy and unsafe. So thanks for uh, teaching those young gentlemen over at, uh, down in Texas how to tackle properly. Uh, and lastly, and this is probably the most significant to our North American listeners, um, Rugby USA is taking steps towards a bid to host Rugby World Cup in either 2027 or 2031. So they're actually doing an investigation to see how viable it will be, how feasible it will be. And they're actually being backed by the uh, Major League Rugby owners. Uh, right now, Australia is apparently the leading bidder for 2027, but Russia is also in there right now. Putin's putting a, a bid, in, bid in for Russia. Um, but it's also looking at, uh, USA is also looking at bid offers for the 2025 and 2029 Women's Rugby World Cup. So they're all, they're hosting FIFA. They're like, they've got a whole bunch of sporting events being held. So they're just looking like, what else can we bring in? And I think that would probably be good for the game. And that brings us to our gray area. If the U.S. bid for the 2027 or 2031 Men's Rugby World Cup, why not involve Canada? They haven't said they're not, but they haven't said they are. But look at Canada and the history of rugby in Canada. It's, we got a deep and rich tradition, deep and rich culture that's rooted in tradition. Uh, and rugby in Canada echoes back well before World War I, back to the 1800s. And we have strong pockets of this game throughout our vast nation. Like we have a great rugby nation and having that opportunity to host a World Cup would be great. And if you look at the U.S., there's lots of room growth. Yeah, U.S. has a lot of money, and, and I think it would be great business-wise for the game itself. It'd be a very lucrative venture if both countries, both uh, Rugby Canada and Rugby USA, could work together. And there's lots of major cities to pull from. You've got your Torontos, your Vancouver's, your Edmonton's in Montreal. I mean, <laughs> even hell, even St. John's or Halifax, you wouldn't get it. You you wouldn't have a big enough venue, but they would sell out every match. You wouldn't be able to get a to, you wouldn't be able to get miles from wherever they're playing the matches. In the U.S., you've got your Vegas, your Boston, your New York, Washington, New Orleans, Atlanta, and others. Like, there's just so many great options that you could have, you know, two, uh, two pools per country. And, you know, in the semifinals, you get a, a pool per country in the finals. Then you go wherever you need to go. But there are a lot of different options. So the question, gray area this week, the question that you're, I, I'd like you to answer, should Rugby Canada and Rugby USA put out a serious joint nations bid for the 2027 World Cup? I think yes. I think it's time that uh, um, the rugby world starts sending some coffers over our way. And uh, I think 2027 is a great option for Rugby Canada and Rugby USA to, to showcase what this side of the pond can actually do when it comes to rugby. And uh, getting there is... One of the things that we need to talk about all the time is the Authentically Bold movement, the Black Lives Matter movement. So Authentically Bold is an initiative set up to support Black Lives Matter. Pam Buisa and Charity Williams are two of the co-founding members. And as they say on their website, we are on a mission to encourage people to believe that they have the power to make a positive difference in their community. It's a great statement. So they're, they're out there supporting and strengthening the creation of Black and Indigenous history curriculum. I'm a teacher. I've actually reached out and they've sent me some documents, which is awesome. Uh, it's great. It's, it's good to have uh, all these extra resources and uh, that we can use in our schools. They've got excellent swag. They've got great shirts for everybody. There's some beautiful stuff. Get online. Uh, check it out. What's even better, this is what impresses me the most, 100% of their profits are being donated to the British Columbia's Black History Society. So there's no profit at all. Anything they make above the creation of the shirts is going right into the, right into the society. Want to check them out? You need to. Check them out at authenticallybold.com. That's authenticallybold.com. Check it out. Buy some swag and support the initiative. Up now, Pat Parfrey. And welcome back. The Canadian Rock, this uh, pod welcomes Pat Parfrey out of St. John's, Newfoundland. Pat, uh, welcome to the Canadian Rock. It's a pleasure to have you here. Pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot. All right. So let's let's get right to it here. So you're born and, and grew up in beautiful St. John's, Newfoundland. I love that city. I love the province. I've been there a couple of times. It's amazing. Fine rugby town, always producing quality players. 
talk to us about how you got involved in rugby, like, you know, the, the younger levels, the high school level, the university level. What was your, uh, what was your development moving up the ranks there? Um, well, I guess my dad's heavily involved with rugby. So he, he grew up and was born in Ireland and played with um, UCC and Munster. And he actually has a cap with Ireland um, uh, when he was, when he was living over there. And then he transitioned to coaching and went over to um, London Irish and then went to, um, to Quebec for a while in Montreal and then eventually studied into um, Newfoundland. So, and he also had a stint with uh, rugby Canada as well as the head coach, but because he's been so involved, I've basically, since I can remember, been a, kind of around rugby. So I have three older brothers, so I'd always go on their trips and always be watching rugby. Um, and then kind of, I guess I've probably been playing since maybe like eight or whenever they were like, would let you kind of play. And um, so I've been, I've been playing since I've been really young. And then for the school, um, I guess, leagues in Newfoundland, I guess we have high school rugby. So I've played a lot of high school rugby with, um, with my, my high school, Holy Heart. And there's no university rugby in Newfoundland. So I actually did my university in Newfoundland. So I didn't actually play university rugby. I just played provincial and um, went on under 20 tours and Canada tours kind of when I was younger and kind of developed through that and then with the the rock kind of tries to train a lot and we we stay active throughout the year even in the winter months and try to stay fit so we, we have a small base of players but we we train a decent amount and try to stay competitive against uh, some of the other um other programs like it's tough to compete against a uh, an ontario who have such a big population when you're small but We've done it in the past, and we've we've upset them every now and then. But there's um, there's a lot of good teams now with uh, like BC and Prairies and Nova Scotia are, are really uh, developed as well now too. Yeah, PEI is uh, I found that the U18 level has really picked up their game too. Yeah, and last last year was the first time I played against them. I I was able to play um, a couple games with Newfoundland when I was home after the MLR because I just wanted to stay in shape and play some games before the. World Cup campaign and anytime I can and I'm allowed to play I'll I'll try to play and we played against PEI and I, and I haven't played them in a long time so last time I played them they weren't that sophisticated and they were oh my god they shocked me and they teed me up so many times I went back into camp with like sore ribs and stuff like that so they they're actually they're a really good squad and they, they might have been just specifically after you too, though. You never know. Right? Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they, they've come a long way for sure. So that, that's that's really interesting. How you know you you, you start young, you miss university because Mun doesn't offer the program because Mun's the only university in Newfoundland, right? Uh, yeah, there's a couple colleges, but Mun's like the the university that people go to, and there's a uh, there's a campus out west uh, associated with Mun as well. Yeah, but for for Mun to travel to play like in the Maritime League, it would be just un unreasonable, unfeasible. Yeah, it'd be very tough. I know they have uh, like basketball and soccer, um, and volleyball and stuff like that. But I'd say with rugby, it's such a big squad. Maybe it's a little tougher. Maybe they can start going into sevens tournaments if that happened. But um, yeah, um, I'm not sure what the future holds for rugby in Newfoundland. There's rumors here and there, but. <laughs> Always scary. Uh, even even in New Brunswick, our, our numbers are down for sure. But uh, with COVID, it's been interesting. I've I've kind of gone. I'm 44, and I've gone back out to my old club team, and it's it's touch. But you know, we're getting 20 to 30 guys out a night playing in a touch league. Like we do two or three drills to, at the start, just game based drills, and then we go into we go into a touch tournament. Uh, so it's it's been really fun to see some of the old guys, some of the younger guys, and. I definitely can't move nearly as well as I used to, but it's a, it's a lot of fun for sure. Actually, a good thing with the touch is that so many different like um, categories of players can play because yeah. we're we're getting a decent amount of interest, and we didn't know how much we would because the leagues or like the kind of tackle is kind of stopped or there's no league. But yeah, people showing up to touch rugby in club environments, it's uh, it's been nice. Yeah, it is. It's uh, it makes a huge difference for sure. And I'm from a very small town, and rugby's been kind of the bread and butter there, so. When over the last few years they get five or six guys to training, and now they're getting twenty to thirty. It's nice to see. So let's talk about your Toronto Arrows experience. We we spoke a little bit before we recorded. You had a season there. You're going to go back this year. Um, obviously, COVID happened. Um, 
at the same time, though, you're, you're working your way through a, a pretty intense program at MUN. Talk to us about that year at the Arrows and your expectations, you know, moving forward with the Arrows plus, you know, trying to finish up your schooling. It's, it can't be a simple process. Yeah, it's, uh, for my first year, it was, it was awesome. I, um, I think the Arrows are a great uh, organization. They run really well, and um, they've been performing really well since they've, they've been in the league. Um, and me going to, the, to, to them in 2019 was, was great for my development because it's quality games and game time experience. And for most of the Canadian players, not a lot of us get to go to play in the European leagues and stuff like that. You don't get that many high quality games and rugby is a game that you need experience in. So I find I've kind of haven't had a whole lot of experience, even though I'm in my late twenties and whatnot. So getting to play with the arrows and being in that kind of professional environment for however, I guess five or six months was very beneficial to me and it helped with my development and kind of gain confidence. So, uh, and it led into playing with the Canadian team. I kind of played a decent, I played some time at 15 with the arrows. And then when I started playing 15 with the Canadian team, I kind of had some consistency and um, confidence build up in, in my game. And hopefully when I get back to playing again, it will continue because I haven't played since the world cup. So it's been a long break. <laughs> yeah. It's been a, you've, you've had a couple of months off there for sure. Yeah. So, so yeah. Sorry, yeah. With the, this year, I'm hoping uh, hoping the league gets back going, and hopefully, I'll be able to get back with them um, in the uh, in the new year. So, your my understanding, you said you were your everything's going to be online. So, if the arrows, you know, pick up and start training in December, or January, what have you, are you going to be able to go back to Toronto and, and join the team? Yes, that's what that's what I hope. So, um, with everything transitioning to online, especially for my coursework, it's not really. Um, I've done all my actual coursework, so most of it's kind of seminar work where it's where it's online. Um, it used to be in class, but now with the coronavirus, I think it's transitioning to online, so it'll be feasible for me to do both. Good. It would be nice to see you back on the pitch with those guys. Yeah, I hope so. What, um, I've been I've been loving the MLR, and I know it's in its infancy, and it's you know it's had bumps along the way the first year or two, but watching how that league has grown over the last few years, what kind of impact can it have? You started to talk about it, but what kind of impact can that have on Rugby Canada and even Rugby USA, like the, the future of our nation, even America, having our own professional league here right in North America? I think it's huge. Um, with, with Rugby Canada now brought back in the Pride program, so with younger players, they can develop there or with their university teams or – what have you. So they get to still play rugby when they're younger. And then when they transition and become more skillful and get to that next level, there's this new league, which when I was growing up, I didn't really think there'd be an option to play in, um, in North America. And I think it's awesome. And the Toronto, I think the arrows have been doing a great job. And if we can get as many Canadians possible playing high level games, it has to be beneficial for Canada. You think some of the other countries that are around our level, they've, they've, developed in leagues whatnot and we've seen they've been kind of getting better and better and where we've kind of kind of stagnated for a while so hopefully with this new new league we'll be getting more games more experience and just becoming better players in, in general so i can't see it not being good for rugby canada i agree you look at uh you look at japan's development over the last 10 years or so just you know playing in super rugby a little bit and uh, hosting the World Cup last year, and there was talks that they were going to join the, the the Six Nations, but I, I read yesterday that they backed out or something. But it's um, you know, ten years ago we were better than Japan, yeah. and now they're ranked you know at least ten spots ahead of us. So they they their development has gone through the roof. I mean, they're in a better area you know geographically, and their time zones are a lot different, and their and their country's not spread out as much as Canada, but. Yeah. It'd be nice if uh, the MLR could get a, a, a team out west and a, and a team here over in the East Coast as well eventually, but I'm yeah, not sure yeah. how long that'll be before that happens. Yeah, that would definitely be uh, be very helpful because the more players we're playing at that level, the more – and then that feeds competition into the national team, and you can't see it not helping. Exactly. 
So back uh, back to you a little bit personally. So you've played 30 plus matches with Canada, uh, including two World Cups. So in, in 2015, you went to England. I don't think you saw any experience, any action. But what did you learn from that in 2015, being there with the guys, training to help you prepare for the 2019 Cup? Um, yeah, I think uh, obviously I, I was disappointed because I got cut um, earlier in the summer. So I've been was training out there and kind of competing and whatnot. And then I was told by Kieran Crowley, like, like, sorry, I really like you, but we're transitioning to another player basically. But uh, I was like, yeah, okay. Um, he said, just, just to let you know, like, stay in shape because, like, the same thing happened to me. Like, I got cut and was called in, uh, like, later because injuries happen. So I went home and still trained and was playing in uh, the club league and stuff like that. So I, th I think um, with the experience and playing with those players, you kind of I, – I think you just have to kind of try to s stay in shape and keep working at it. And for me, I, I, I actually do think I needed more experience and – I'd say probably more confidence um, when I was a little younger, when you play with the older guys, you kind of go into your shell a little bit and you don't really think, um, think you're as good of a player as you are. So playing with those guys, when you move up and you see, and they always tell you like, like don't be nervous and stuff like that. So it's good playing with good, good players like that who, who will try to give you confidence. And so then in the, ne the next four years, I've kind of tried to, be a bit more of a leader and try to break out of my shell and and um, try to, I guess, play more consistently um, with with the national team and um, it's been be beneficial. Um, even going into the 2019 World Cup, I was questioning if I was going to make the team or not, but um, luckily I played well enough to crack the squad. Well, watching the 2019 World Cup for me personally, watching you play was was a coming out party for you. You were, in my opinion, one of the better Canadians uh, consistently throughout each match you guys played. Um, and watching you, I, I gained a new respect for you as a rugby player. And uh, I, I think, I think that what you took from the 2015 World Cup helped you. Um, just you know, those daily habits, kind of the things that you've been talking about, and it, and it helped you become one of the better Canadians in that tournament. Going into that, what were your personal expectations for the World Cup? Because it was a, you know, it was a different environment for you than twenty than twenty fifteen. Uh, yeah, I um, thanks for that though. Um, the uh, going into the twenty nineteen, like the year started, and I kind of didn't know where I was uh, within standing for the starting lineup or for the squad in general. Um, and then when we you get the release of the spreadsheet and. Like, there's guys like, I don't know, Peter Nelson gets added, and you're like, who's Peter Nelson? You, like, search him up. You're like, oh, wait, he plays 15 or 10 and 15? And I'm like, oh, here's another. And it's good, though, in camp because you're competing and everything. And it kind of brings the, brings, brings the best out of players. But, uh, yeah, I, I didn't know if what was going to happen with uh, starting or not. And um, I thought I played reasonably well in, the, in like, the first – our first hit out. And then – the, the lineups kind of get mixed and matched. So you're always, I don't know what's going to happen. Am I going to play? And then I guess I um, got subbed on against Tonga and played a good 20 minutes. And then they just put me in the next game and I played another good game. I believe I got, um, I think it was against the Leinster club squ squad. And from then I kind of just kept playing consistent and, um, and playing well and kept that starting jersey because um, going into it I didn't have a clue if I was going to be able to play but with I guess the competition and being able to play consistently I uh, held on to that so I was pretty pleased uh, overall I was definitely delighted to, to play well. That's great. Um, I want, you guys played some talented squads I mean you're in a really a, a kind of a pool of death for you guys you had New Zealand and South Africa right off the hop almost you know, you're out there. What's it like facing the Hawk on a World Cup stage? It was amazing. I I thought it was uh, it's kind of something when you're watching rugby, you and you're a rugby player, you kind of want to envision playing against us. And going there, the the Japanese community were amazing. They supported all the teams so well, and uh, they spoiled everyone. But they had a packed crowd. were standing in front of them and. It goes silent for the Hakka. Really cool experience. It's not like intimidating. It kind of pumps you up as a rugby player because you're like, oh, this is so cool. But 
uh, then the crowd just erupts and you get, I think about 30 seconds to a minute to break to kind of get together as a team before the kickoff. Cause you don't want to be too emotional or anything like that. <laughs> you want to kind of be level-headed, but facing that was amazing. And facing the team was a, a lesson in itself. They're such a good team. You make any mistake, they're scoring you no matter what, like, uh, like defensively, if you're too tight or too wide, they know exactly where to go. And yeah, they exposed us a lot throughout that game, but it was a cool experience to play them. So when you're standing there and you're looking out and there's, you know, Bowden Barrett and Kieran Reed and Sonny Bill Williams and, and, and the list goes on and on. And then, you know, you're, you're playing South Africa and there's the beast, there's after clerk, there's, you know, Malcolm Marks, you know, as a, these are rugby royalties to us, right? Like if you're, if you're playing hockey, that's there's there's Gretzky over there, there's Crosby over in that side, there's Ovechkin over there. Um, talk to some of our listeners about facing maybe some of those players that are so world class that, you know, if you're a rugby people, you know them. But if you're not a rugby person, maybe you don't understand the depth of their abilities and what they can actually do. Yeah, and I guess it's uh, it'd be a little different for me for some of the frontline guys because I'm not dealing with all the physicality I'm, I'm standing at the back uh, playing 15. Yeah, but there's that's, one... that's a great spot for you to actually take in what's happening. Right. Cause like there was one time, like some of my friends were like, Oh, you ta- you just tackled Sonny Bill Williams at the, like after the game. Cause he made a break and I had to cover tackle him, but he literally just like passed the ball and fell over my shoulders. So it wasn't like a demanding tackle or anything, but when I'm watching it's for me, I was, you're running all over the place and you're trying to see what the ten's doing. And then they have Bowden Barrett, like who's the best player in the world. Well, Richie Mwanga is awesome as well for their fly half, but then he's going, you're like, Oh, do I worry about him instead? The other side. <laughs> so you're kind of in two minds uh, a lot of the time. And then their wingers do a great job at kind of holding the width. Like I remember Jordy used to always just be waving his hand and then screaming for the ball. And I would kind of be like, oh, is he going to kick and drop back a bit and then would have to rush up to cover a tackle or something like that. So it's kind of their their positioning on the field and their decision-making is just outstanding because even their forwards can just do a run square, pull the pass back yeah. behind to the 10 or something like that. And it's it's pretty impressive to see. They, they've just grown up playing their yeah. whole lives and they're all, uh, they're all so skilled. As at 15, too, you're looking out, you know, you've got Rich Mwanga at 10, you've got Bowden at 15, you've got Jordy at wing, who, who's the size of a second row almost. <laughs> it's going to be, li- <laughs> be a little intimidating at times. Um, so, unfortunately, the, the Namibia match was canceled due to, the, due to the storm. One of the things that I've always loved about being Canadian and rugby is service. So when I take my high school team on trips, we always do service, whether we visit, you know, a children's hospital or we take toys to a boys and girls club or whatever. A lot of you and your teammates uh, did clean up after the typhoon. Um, can you walk us through some of that experience? Yeah, for sure. Um, obviously we were devastated in the morning because we heard the game got canceled and that was the one we were, we were kind of hoping to, at the start of our campaign was, okay, Italy first. And then, um, and then our other game we were hoping to win was uh, Namibia. And obviously we didn't perform too well against Italy and didn't uh, get the result we were hoping for. But then, then we were focused on Namibia when the time came. And uh, that getting canceled was kind of upsetting and disappointing. But we didn't really think much of... Um, how hit how badly hit the the city was in Kayamishi and we kind of just went up went our day normally and then our manager I believe it was Alana and Gareth kind of brought up the idea of would anybody be willing to help out and we didn't realize that it was actually there's places that were too too badly damaged so they brought up the idea and a, and a bunch of us kind of were like yeah yeah we'll help out um so we organized a bus to help out and kind of clear some streets and help out with some houses um, throughout the city and th- that community supported us so well and they like the whole the whole tour we were there in Japan they spoiled us so if um, if they they deserve to be uh, helped back by have us help them back so um, we we just decided yeah to help out 
Yeah, made great press over here on the side of the pond for sure. And it's just one of those things you don't see a lot of other sports digging in and helping out and nothing against any other sport, but a lot of the times that's not the case. So it was nice to see. Um, back on an individual here, just recently you were recognized by Rugby Canada with the Canadian Shield Award. Um, very impressive, absolutely. Talk to us about what that means to you, getting the, the Canadian Shield Award. It, yeah, it meant a lot. I, uh, I was quite surprised um, when I heard it, and it's one of those awards that it's, I'm honored to receive because it's voted on by the players and your teammates who you go out uh, to receive. And I guess as a rugby player, it's a team sport, so you you more so want to get those wins and those uh, the, like the team wins and uh, perform on the field like as a team rather than individually. And but um, but being recognized by them afterwards uh, was was a great honor, and I'm very pleased to pleased to accept it. I'm not sure if it was uh, what the what what people were voting on, if it was rugby play or they just liked me as a guy or something. But <laughs> I'm still still very delighted to uh, receive it and to get it from all your friends and teammates is uh, just a cherry on the top. Yeah, that, that makes a difference because you know you've earned their respect, right? So. All right, so let's let's jump in now. We're gonna we're gonna do our quick fire section, Pat. So, like I said off the top, we're get about twenty questions or so. Not meant to think, um, just to kind of see a little bit of your personality. First half are rugby based, last half are more individual based on you. you ready? Yeah. All right. First one: best team you've ever faced. New Zealand. At twenty nineteen. Last twenty nineteen, yeah. Best player you ever faced. Uh huh. I guess I would say Bowden Barrett in that same game. <laughs> That's fair. All right. Next question is toughest player you ever faced. And usually I say it's, it's a one V one. They have the ball. Who do you not want that person to be? Uh, that's a tough one. I'm trying to think of like a, an actual player. Cause in, like that I played against, but cause in, in like training or Canada, when I was younger, I used like, Jeb Sinclair used to like bully me. So I used to be like, oh, sh here we go again. Or like if Jeb's. I had – Jeb was there, Jeb's big head, I'd be like, <laughs> uh, here we go. And I, I played on – he played on Atlantic Rock and uh, and with each other. But he, he'd he be a guy or I'd be like, oh, no. Like he's going to try to punish me here. So That's fair. I can see his head swelling right now listening to that too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sevens or fifteens? I'm fifteens, yeah. I'm Best sure. match you were ever a part of? Um, that's match. The second half against South Africa in the World Cup was pretty impressive. It was pretty, pretty special. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, like, that would be a cool one. The All Blacks one, I like, they crushed us. So I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to think of um, one I would sh outshine because I would say like the World Cup was the coolest experience, but um, I would want to put a a win like my first cap I was ecstatic we we beat the states and that tour we we won a bunch of games and then there, there's a game in uh in Germany actually where or in Spain when we beat Spain and it was a an awesome awesome game and experience to uh to get like a test cap win and stuff like that so that one was actually pretty cool as well okay Spain and your first cap good choices favorite rugby tradition Ooh, I think I guess the the song after your first cap uh, is a pretty good one. Um, sometimes people don't. Well, sometimes you don't really see it coming, but some be some people throw out some good tunes out there. What was yours? Do you remember? Yeah, mine was uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the uh, the like nineteen nineties cartoon uh, show. One of your favorite shows, or? <laughs> I grew up, and for some reason, I knew the the theme song for it. And I'm I'm pretty I'm a pretty animated singer. So uh, can, you, can you give us a little taste of that? <laughs> uh, Come on, you know I you want so, it. Yeah, like, teenage mutant ninja turtles, teenage mutant ninja turtles. But the the verses are the pretty uh, pretty animated parts. Yeah, fair enough. That was pretty good. Well done. All right, best team you've played with team uh i would say that uh that 2015 squad was i thought was a really good um 
really good team. I thought they were unfortunate to not get a couple wins in that uh, that um, that World Cup. I thought there was just a lot of great players and experienced players, and they they had some mean forward forward pack players as well. So I, I would I would throw them up as yeah. the best team I've played with. Yeah, they had a couple of bad bounces in a couple of games that could have went either yeah, way. Yeah, they were really close to Italy and yep. um, and even France. They were within striking right to the end the last like ten minutes. Yeah, what's your rugby nickname? Um, I guess Parfs. Some people call me Parfs or Pass. Like I don't have an actual uh, rugby style nickname, but some people just shorten up my uh, my last name. Fair enough. Who's the player that you'd love to smash the most? Jeb? <laughs> yeah, if, if I could hit Jeb. <laughs> I'm not much of a heavy hitter, so maybe maybe if I got around Jeb or stepped him, it, it, it'd feel, feel good. That's fair. All right. All right. What's your rugby superstition? Um. I usually don't have a huge superstition. I try to eat PB and J's because they're easy on the on the <laughs> game. PB and J, uh, yeah, peanut butter and jelly because they're just nice. sweet. Yeah, I'm always like, uh, white bread, quick sugars. They'll just get into your body pretty quick and <laughs> bog you down. So that's been a decent transition. And then I don't really have like a music I listen to all the time. I kind of flip flop. Um, a lot of the times I try to like have like chill music before the game as like we're on the bus but because you show up kind of early and then once you get there you kind of pick it up and usually we have a guy who plays music on the speaker who kind of amps it up but I, and then I like going out on the field and having a little look around and then getting the gear on and usually have kind of a, a similar warm-up that I do every every game so that the warm-up would probably be my biggest uh kind of semblance or I wouldn't say superstition but kind of uh Thing that's the same. It's something to get you focused and ready to go. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, I'm not sure if you've watched the uh, Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance. I have. It's. A, it's. I've enjoyed it. All right. So, give me from players you've played with your Jordan, your Pippen, and your Rodman. Whoa, that was. <laughs> see. This one is a little bit of a thinker, but. You could e the easy one for Rodman is Jeb. He's been nominated a couple of times for the Rodman by other people. I, I could yeah, I could see Jeb as the Rodman. The the or Cudmore. Did you play with Jamie? I have, yeah. <laughs> I feel like the I could see like Nate Hariyama in the sevens um, environment being like a Michael Jordan. He's so just cool, relaxed, and like. But when when it's competition on, he he he's dialed in. <laughs> And, uh, and really wants to win. Um, Pippen. Hmm. I could see, I could even see like Cudmore being a, like kind of a Pippen style just because he's like, he's just, a, I'm trying to think of like really, really elite players like, on, on, our, on our teams and he's been a great leader and stuff like that. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, and then, yeah, I guess Jeb can take the rock. <laughs> All right, so next one, your choice, three to take golfing or three to take fishing, whatever your, whatever suits your fancy there. What do you, you prefer, golf or fishing? Um, I've, I've golfed more often, uh, and I've done a decent amount of cod jigging, but I've never, like, fly fished or anything like that, so um, maybe I need to get someone to take me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, golfing, the best – golfers i've played with would be nate hariyama and liam underwood okay they're really good and cole keith is really good as well oh don't be tell i'm not going to tell cole that yeah yeah his so, head will swell for sure yeah and i feel like <laughs> i feel like i i wouldn't have an option not to take cole actually he'd be he'd hear about it and be like oh yeah well, what time and he'll, he'll yeah, show, up. show up he'd be the fifth guy <laughs> he, love, he loves it so those are three three golfers that i know are uh are good and I think um, I think I know Ray, Ray Barkwell likes to golf and like Nick Blevins and Phil Mack they like like to golf as well yeah so there, there's a few guys who who definitely like to uh, get on the links and I've always I've always thought that Nick Blevins looked like an off-duty cop when he played <laughs> yeah. <It's been laughs> that, huh? that's right <laughs> uh, yeah. oh man I love that guy um, 
Then for fishing, I'd pick um, Sean Duke and Nate Harry, or Sean Duke and uh, Harry Jones were my roommates, and I'd pick them for going on a little fishing trip. Um, let's see if I'd pick. Uh, you probably have to take Cole again. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, geez, I, I'm. There's a few guys that, uh, like, um, like Jamie McKenzie. Ben Lesage, and then like pro probably someone like uh, like Bailey or Jake Hilnicki. The the, the geez, picking three is tough. I'd have to take uh, Harry and uh, Duker though as okay. uh, as roommates and uh, fishing buddies. And then well, we can leave it at two. And then probably Jamie McKenzie. He spoiled me a couple times and uh, <laughs> and brought me out to his cabin. He's uh, he's he's an awesome dude as well. I'm trying to get him and Phil on to do like a brother one, but we just oh. we can never line up a time to go at the same time. So oh, yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> um, what's a go-to travel destination? Travel destination. Um, it's usually revolved around rugby, so <laughs> I don't really get a time off. But uh, so probably Jamie's cabin. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we we had a pretty good trip after after World Cup down to uh, um, Southeast Asia, so that was pretty cool. Nice travel desolation because usually most of my my trips are through uh, through rugby, so I, I don't really have like vacation time because I usually come home when I have uh, some time off. Yeah, but, uh, that trip was really fun. Nice. What's your most used app on your phone? I wonder if I can check and see. <laughs> You an iPhone user or an Android? I'm an iPhone user. Oh, boo! I would say probably Twitter. <laughs> okay. Twitter or and right right now I'm like I'm I love fantasy football and stuff like that and I I love sports. <laughs> so right now sports is back and fantasy football is thriving, so I'm kind of di dialed into it constantly <laughs> on, my, on Twitter to try to see the news. All right. So yeah, I'd say t Twitter. Who's your favorite football team? The Eagles. Philadelphia. Okay. Yeah. What, do you have a favorite team? Green Bay. Green Bay? Oh, nice. nice. What's your go-to food? Mm, go-to food. I love uh, kind of like a nicely cooked steak would be like my favorite thing. Um, and I did like over the, the well, we had a, a, a first quarantine before the, this one here. Um, we had Snowmageddon down here. <laughs> Uh, right. It was like a, it was crazy. We had so much snow. I, I shoveled my sideways and then took a video and it's like up to here, like, and it's literally just a shovel length to get out. It took me like the full day, but um, I ended up buying like a, like kind of like a machine called a sous vide, and it uh, kind of keeps the temperature of the water like the same and cooks the, cooks the meat. So, I've been using that a lot, <laughs> and. Uh, so I, I like cooking a steak through that and whatnot. So I'd say steak's my probably favorite dish. And then um, most consistent for rugby would be the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's awesome. All right. Ch chips or cookies? Yeah. I, just, I do. I love that peanut butter and jelly sandwich before. Yeah. before tons of sugars. That's right. I, I would say chips for that. Yeah. They're just, I do okay. love cookies. Like I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a treats guy, but. Uh, okay. What kind of chips? Uh, Miss Vicky's. Yeah. The uh, sea salt and malt vinegar, maybe? Yeah, yeah. They're probably my – I usually – the store usually – I'll grab a bag here or there and chip away at it through the week. And sea salt and uh, vinegar, malt vin or vinegar is good. And then they've got, they've got a lot of flavors now. They've picked up their – well, they probably always had them. But yeah. the store I go to, they, they have a lot. Yeah, they're, they're the good ones. Right now is uh, – I think they're, they're Chipotle one or something like that. Okay. Haven't had those. Might try them out. A little bit blue bag. It's good. All right. French fries or onion rings? I'd say French fries more consistently for me. French fries or poutine? I'd say consistently, I would say still get the French fries, but poutine is a nice treat. It is. Um, have you ever made anybody kiss the cod? I've never made anyone kiss the cod. Actually, I've been around where people have gone doing the, like doing it, and uh, we've done it once when we had the the Sharon Cup in Newfoundland. All the teams had the option of, I think, uh, ha like uh, going through all the rituals and everything. So 
I've been around it, but I, I haven't actually held the card to make someone kiss it. You, you've watched the screeching process, but never. Oh, yeah, yeah. Never. I did it about 20 years ago. I was over visiting my brother when he lived in Newfoundland. And uh, they didn't have any card. They had Capeland. Oh, and yeah. I was first up of the three guys that were there. And they said, because it's not a card, you have to bite the head off. They were joking, and I didn't know that, so I bit the head off. <laughs> anyway, they fed me liquor all night for free because I did it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, what's your favorite beer? So many craft beers now. I'm try I, I don't know if I uh, can pick one of those. I think uh, I think Kitty Vitty Light would be my favorite, but it's getting uh, it's getting disbanded. So maybe, oh. maybe the Iceberg is my. They're, well, they're they're transitioning into another light beer just for remarketing. I think so. It's probably very similar. Uh, but maybe the Iceberg is my favorite. But just. Just a nice lager I, I can drink uh, throughout the day is my favorite to, to go into. I used to love the, uh, I don't know if they still sell it over there, Old Dom I think it was Old Dominion or something, or Dominion yeah, beer. They still got it around, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I used to drink that whenever I go over Yeah, we had a, a meal the other week at the house, and uh, and Dad picked up uh, a case of that, and I was like, wow, I haven't seen that in a while. <laughs> uh, what's a guilty pleasure? PB&J? PPJ, um, probably a DQ Blizzard would be a daily pleasure for me. I love, I love them. I actually haven't had one in a while, but there. Now, that, now that you bring it up, I might have to. Today's a good day. Yeah. The what's the beer? So, <laughs> what's the best place for a, a post match beer? In Newfoundland, I would say the Republic. That's uh, that's where I go usually all the time after um, after a game in town and. Uh, Steve Power, the owner, kind of he he's been a rugby player and and supports the rugby community, so we we usually stop in there a lot. Nice. What series are you binge watching now? Um, I just start, uh, the boys on Amazon Prime. Have you heard of it? I have. I watched the trailer for it last night. It looks good. Yeah, I I, I enjoy it. It's kind of like a a superhero show, like kind of like. I guess DC with like Superman and whatnot, but um, it's pretty dark. Like yeah. all the superheroes are a little messed up and everything like that. So um, it's a nice little spin on the superhero genre they have. But there's some, it's, it's kind of gruesome here and there. Is it a DC show or? No, it's just Amazon Prime. Like they're all just like new ca characters and stuff like that. But it's like one of the characters is pretty similar to like Superman or something like that. So okay. Wonder Woman. What's your favorite movie? And you're on your second cup of something there. That's a different cup than you had the first time. <laughs> yeah, I got water and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 need I need to stay hydrated and white. <laughs> the movie would probably be Gladiator. Okay, the, the Russell Co Crowe one or the boxing one in Chicago? Uh, the, the Russell Crowe one. Russell Crowe one, okay. Oh, I love that movie. That's a good one. All right, so this might help then. Who would play you in the Netflix movie of your life? Russell Crowe does own a rugby team, and yeah. he's from Australia. He's, he's, I'm thinking of like someone younger, though. Someone younger? Russell Crowe 20 years ago. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Russell Crowe 20 years ago, the, the gladiator version. <laughs> yeah. Man, someone now, I don't, geez, I don't know. It'd be tough. I, I just love Tom Holland, but I think, I don't yeah. know how, how big he is. He looks pretty tiny, but he's also yeah. standing beside like Chris Hemsworth and Chris exactly. Evans quite a lot, right? Exactly. I'm like I'm, I'm not, I'm not huge compared to some of the, yeah. the forwards on our team. So, yeah. like I could be a smaller, smaller guy. Tom Holland works, I think. Who would yeah. play the leading lady? Leading lady mm, would have to be a brunette. So, why does it have to be brunette? <laughs> My significant other right now is a brunette. <laughs> so just a few people won't an that never answer this question. Uh, Connor Trainer, he's like, I'm not answering that. I will get in so much trouble. <laughs> yeah, so I, can, I, I don't know if I can if I if I pick a pick an actual. I'm I'm very bad with names too, so I'm trying to think of of someone that would work, but I'm but I'm stumped. You could just say your significant other and get her into the movie. Yeah, industry. yeah. yeah. Probably be, be good at acting. And and last one for the quick fire. What would the movie be called? Um, 
Puh. Family ties. <laughs> Maybe you get uh, Michael J. Fox to be in it or something too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Quite my bad. laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. So that's it for the quick fire. We only have a few questions left, Pat. I appreciate it. So this one, I think I know who it is, but you might, you'd probably elaborate a little bit more. Who had the biggest impact on you as a player? Um, I would say my dad. Yes. He, um, da dad or mom, uh, they both really supported me throughout my life and my rugby career, but with dad being so heavily involved with, uh, with rugby, he, pre he definitely had my, the greatest impact. Um, he did, sometimes he gets a little upset and or he doesn't, sometimes he doesn't even want to go to my games because he wants to be focused on, I guess, watching me or if I don't play, he kind of is like, uh, like he gets a little upset, but he's also try. he also can't be biased or anything. And he's always talking to people watching, uh, watching the game. So, Sometimes he, uh, nowadays he's, he gets a little hesitant if he wants to go, but um, <laughs> he's definitely had my biggest impact. And he's been my coach when I was younger and um, always been around and uh, kind of giving me advice. Uh, he's, he's definitely the one that's kind of kept, kept me in, involved in school and rugby. Like, I'd be like, I want to go out to Vic to start the karting program. And he'd be like, well, should try to do this this and this <laughs> as well to like to stay on top of it and then with my with my mom she um she unfortunately passed away um a, a, a four years ago and um but she was always very supportive and um kind of always would be at everything and would know like stats about like any player like it was crazy it'd be like oh like you uh like under 20 it'd be like oh it's you like liam underwood and carlin hamstra are like i'll i'll play 10 and like this is their background i'm like how do you know this like it's like Moms these are, are awesome friends. These Moms are are awesome like that stuff <laughs> yeah so she'd always supported me and uh and would always look for the best for me so yeah both of them were definitely my best supporters yeah that's great what are your thoughts on what makes a great team player? Team player, um, I would say that's for rugby. We have what twenty three people in the starting lineup, and probably for a bigger squad, like if you're going on tour, you'd have th thirty probably with the Canadian team go on tour, and even more that's at home with like like for the Toronto Arrows, there'll be more at home. So it's such an important thing, and even like on the staff would be required for being team players because they put so much work and effort in. So the team should be helping them as well. And they should, and as they're helping us. So it's such a key thing for, for a team sport. Um, and like, I guess hard work would be one of them. You see people working hard. It's, you kind of want to jump on top of that. And then like doing the little things, just doing a little bit extra to help each other out. And, uh, and doing like, um, and like even just what I, like helping the staff out, like carrying bags, carrying this th and that. Like no one f should be above carrying stuff. Like even if you're been with the team for 15 years, you should still be helping take stuff off and putting stuff on. So it's it's a it's kind of an aspect in um, in rugby for that you try to kind of drill it in. If you're a rookie or if you're a vet, you still help out. And if you're a rookie, maybe you should try to be helping out a bit more and make it look, make it show that you really want to be involved with the team. And then another aspect would be kind of helping each other out and like buying into the team environment. Like you don't want to be above the the team ever. And then helping each other out. Like usually after practices, everyone kind of does little extras and whatnot. And like um, I found Tyler Ardron brought in like trying to do little things and he'd always would he's so experienced and was away in New Zealand at the time um and he'd bring in like trying to help out our forward packs about like little things or, or like little drills after thing like after training and like we I'd work with the nines or something like that and a bunch of the back three to just like we'd all work together Tyler would be helping out uh, with little things he's learned and then um like I don't know like someone like Dan Moore I could think of as like such a good team guy and he's he was the captain for the arrows and is a wicked leader but he's just always helps out always tries to be like help out with each other always working so hard always like like 
worrying about like if this is all right for his teammates and and the staff as well. So he'd be a guy to throw out would be like such a g- good team guy. I think everything you just you just said there basically uh, alluded to being a big family, right? Having having your hardworking people, having your people that are willing to help out. Um, it just, it's very reminiscent of what families go through. Sometimes there's some, you know, scrapping or arguing, but you always have the best interest of other, of other people at heart. Um, I love what you're saying too, about cleaning and, you know, helping carry stuff. Um, I, I love reading about the all blacks and watching documentaries about the all blacks. And that's, you know, one of the big things for them is cleaning the sheds or watching, you know, um, in 2015 when Canada and New Zealand played in Richie McCaw or 2011, sorry. And Richie McCaw didn't start, but he wore the water jersey and he was carrying water out for his teammates. You know, something as simple as that is is absolutely amazing in the rugby culture, um, where there there is a hierarchy, but there really isn't a hierarchy at the same time. Everybody's on the same page and you know towing the same rope at the same time. So, I think you, you kind of nailed that attribute down quite well there. It is it is true, yeah. The team I would consider is such it's like a big family. It is it is so true. You spend so much time with each other, and then even when you're on tour, they're like the only people you see and you do gain like a lot of love for your, your teammates and stuff like that. So it is, it is very reminiscent of the family. Yeah. As a rugby player, I mean, you're how old are you now? Late twenties? 28. Yeah. 28. So you still get some, you still get a few good years left. Hopefully, you, yeah. yeah. I think I imagine you do. What do you want to be remembered for? So maybe, you know, it's uh, 29. So maybe it's 2039. 20 year reunion of the 2019 rugby world cup. What do you want those teammates of yours to say about you? What do you want to be remembered for? I would, I would like to say that they, uh, that I was like super fast and explosive, <laughs> but that's not really me. So <laughs> I can't really put those in the, into the category, but um, I think uh, it's like hardworking and like a, and a like great teammates. Um, like, especially if it was my team teammates saying it, um, I would really appreciate stuff like that. And, like, in my game, I think uh, I try to bring consistency just because I'm not the fastest guy or I'm not the, the most explosive. So, like, consistency and hard work, being a good teammate. And then I'm usually known for, for talking a lot, so they, they, might, uh, they might remember that, but... <laughs> I'm not too sure. That's fair. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit now. You're, you're, you're at Munn, you're Memorial University. And talk to us about the program you're taking, I guess the challenges that have possibly posed you by taking such a oh, intensive program while playing rugby. What's, the, what's your balance like there? Um, it's been, uh, been reasonably reasonably good i've i've been lucky enough when i'm away i've been able to organize some online courses that um that i've been able to coordinate with my programs like uh when i when when i first went out to live in victoria i was finishing my undergrad and i was able to finish it with online courses but i still missed a lot of time in my first couple years through under 20 trips and canada trips so being on tour and trying to study is really tough i find i and uh I'm doing my application for for med school and looking at like my terms and I can, you can just see like years where you're on tour a lot it's like the scores are show so it's um it, it can be tough because you usually kind of forget about it and or you just don't you're tired and you're 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 putting in a half half ass effort um, at some of the aspects but it's been benef- beneficial that I'm able to do both because literally I just wanted to play rugby for a long time. So if, if having my dad kind of stay on top of me and be like, try to do this um, helped out. And then in, I've had chunks where I've been able to uh, kind of buckle down and study like uh, after the, I think it was after the 2015 world cup, I was decided that I was going to stay. So I was, would have started my um, PhD um program at that time and I had a year where I just crushed out a bunch of um, coursework and then the next year I went back out west and was able to finish off the couple courseworks with I think three online actual courses um, and I still had the seminar stuff to do but I was able to finish those three and then stay with rugby and then there was about a four-month block or three-month block where I was able to kind of come home and just focus on my 
comprehensive exam. It's a, it's kind of like a final exam for your PhD. You got a, you have four different sections and uh, a couple of um, exam committee members who ask you questions as well. So um, it's like a two day kind of, um, kind of thing that uh, I had to kind of study hard for. And if I was playing, if I was away on tour, I don't think I'd be able to put in a full effort for that. And then with this stuff that happened now, I was able to study for the, uh, for the MCAT. So I've had little blocks where if you do have blocks and breaks, um, I was try to get as much work as you can through those. And then with uh, when you're on tour, try, try to find some players like find Ben Lesage was really, is really good at doing both. Um, and he's just, he's just such a hardworking and committed guy that he, uh, he was able to graduate while trying to, while successfully making the World Cup. So yeah, <laughs> so that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Time management's a hard skill for a lot of a lot of people to uh, ascertain, and you know, playing top level rugby at the same time as you know doing a doing a program like yourself. That's uh, I'm sure you could give a lot of advice to high school students and university students about time management for sure. So last thing, Pat. Any any great rugby stories you can share with us? Feel free to throw an old mate under the bus. Like it's entirely up to you. That's what I'm. Uh, that's what I'm trying to trying to think about. I'm like, uh, can't <laughs> what type of stories? But um, I guess one story with the 2015 World Cup. I guess is uh, we were. I was back home and playing in the club league there, and we had a game against uh, my team's called the Swallows. We had a game against the dogs and we were playing against them and it was pouring rain. So there was like no one really at the game. And um, unfortunately I believe kind of braid got injured and you don't really want to hear when one of your friends gets injured. Um, so it was unfor- like sad to see- hear that, but um, they were trying to call me in for the squad. So they realized I was on the field and they were like, get him off the field. <laughs> So we're playing in this pouring rain weather and I, I believe we just scored and we're lining up for a kickoff and they couldn't get a hold of anyone. And then there's people they're getting a hold of and they're like, well, nah, we're not at the game. It's pouring rain. And eventually they call the sports complex across the street and the guy answers and they're like, can you go to the field and get <laughs> Patrick Prairie off the field? And this guy run, walks on the field and everyone's like looking at him and he's just like, Patrick Parfrey has to come off the field. And my brother looks at him. He goes, no, he's not. Like, are you, are you crazy? Who are you? Uh, and then it's just like, he, uh, he's like, no, no, no. He has to come off the field. And everyone's arguing. He was like, I think he just called, called up to the World Cup. And everyone's like, <laughs> both teams, like, look at me. And they're like, get off the field. Hey! Get off the field. <laughs> yeah, get off the field. So ended up going off the field and just having, like, had a bunch of missed calls and, literally just had to sit there like looking at my phone until it rang again <laughs> and called me and was like yeah like congratulations mate like we're gonna i think we're gonna fly you out tomorrow so like no rush or anything like that so i got showered out up hung out with the team like went to grab a bite and go to uh go to the pub because it was during the world cup so we we're just gonna watch watch one of the games and during that kind of transition time i got another call and think it was Gareth again uh and he was like yeah Kieran says he uh because Kieran Crowley was the coach at the time he was Kieran says he that you he wants to get you here as fast as possible so there's a flight leaving in like a couple hours you think you can get that one and I was like yep <laughs> like yep. just like <laughs> in my car, grab my stuff and obviously like not very hard to to pack for something like that you just throw in a bunch of bunch of rugby gear and cleats and maybe a couple clothes but and it's a short flight to... across the Atlantic there to England so yeah, the, the tough part was I uh because I played in that game and then immediately sat on a plane I showed up to do it and then we had to get in a car and drive off and I get there and I'm like my hammy's all tight so I'm like <laughs> I'm getting physio and Karen like lo- Karen like walks into the physio room he's like what are you doing in here I'm like yes my hammy stuff she's like we didn't bring you into like kind of joking with me and like <laughs> bring you into to be injured. So I was like sweating the whole like every training session. I'm like, oh, my hammy is still a little tight, but I can't really can't really show this. Yeah. Like obviously I wasn't really expecting to get into a lineup, but it was I had to warm up for the last game because 
everyone's bang, banged up and possibly injured. So they're like, well, this guy's got to train to, or warm up to see if he's healthy and it ended up doing it. So, so <laughs> that would have been a bad, bad experience. <laughs> it's neat how you get there though. That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's, it is pretty funny, pretty funny story. Having a club game in Newfoundland and hopping on a plane to go, go join the world cup squad, a squad yeah. in England. So, <laughs> that's I, I just love this this guy just randomly walks in the field patrick parfrey get off the field <laughs> like, and everyone and all our team was like are you crazy man who like, are you like what's going on yeah <laughs> well, that's awesome and listen i really p- appreciate your time pat and uh you know i wish you the best as you finish up your degrees and uh you know hopefully uh, we'll see you back on the pitch here soon with toronto and canada uh once the covid finally uh once we finally kick the covid's ass there so thank you very much for joining us yeah, thanks a lot for having me. It was a great time. Awesome. <laughs> thanks very much, Pat. That was a lot of fun. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to chat with us here at the Canadian Rock. Uh, it sounds like you got a pretty hectic schedule with university and, and you know, trying to stay prepped and ready for uh, the Arrows and Rugby Canada. So thanks for taking the time. Really appreciate it. I uh, wish you the best of luck finishing up your degree. Definitely look forward to seeing you with the Arrows and Rugby Canada, hopefully in the near future. Um, love you have you on again that would be really cool if you join us again maybe a round table or just have another conversation uh, next two pods are uh, in my queue and they'll be out in about a week we got a week uh, for Matt Heaton and then probably a week after that we're gonna have Aaron Carpenter and uh, Charity Williams and Rod Snow have both committed we're just trying to line up sometimes to chat and many others um, many others are going to be peering as well so we've got a lot of people lined up and uh, the biggest thing for me is that school's back in um, a little harder to try and find time where you know I'm in New Brunswick and trying to line up a time where uh, I can chat with with guests uh, via Zoom. Uh, Zoom definitely makes it easier but uh, with me being in class and people working sometimes it's a little tricky so we're doing our best to, to try and get a pot up every seven to ten days now it'll slow down during uh, my extended March break from uh, you know after March break until about two weeks ago where I was home still working but I was actually home it made it a little bit simpler but I will do my best to keep them coming as continually as possible because I think it's, I think it's great. And I hope, uh, hopefully you all think it's great that we've get a lot of these uh, rugby Canadian legend and, and messages and voices on the air. Uh, as always need to thank uh, Ben sound music uh, that supplies for their our intro and, and uh, closing tunes. And as always feel free to request topics for future podcasts, re- request guests, uh, have questions ready for some of the guests that you see that are coming up. That would be cool too. So, For the now, this is Jamie, and until next time, I want you to stay safe, I want you to stay healthy, I want you to stay sane. Most importantly, I want you to keep on rocking. Mm -hmm.